And I love that prophecy from Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus that talks about this new creation that's coming, this time when the, the wolf and the lamb will hang out together and not be afraid of each other. Um, so that's our focus today is on this idea of uh, new creation, shalom with the created world. And I think um, as we talk about this, it's easy to, to sort of write this off in some ways in our minds because it doesn't feel super spiritual. Um, we think about environmentalism as something that is politicized or it's economy driven or something like that. And we don't think about it as very spiritual. And we also don't see how we can really make a difference sometimes. How does one person really make an impact? You know, if I put the plastic water bottle in this trash can versus that one, you know, what am I really accomplishing? And so what I hope we can do today is kind of see a broader picture of what it means for us to have shalom with creation and how humans and and creation are, are really kind of linked. And what we've been talking about in this series Um, is that shalom is the way things ought to be. It's the way things ought to be. It's bigger than just peace. It's bigger than just an absence of conflict. It's this sense of flourishing and life and harmony and that we are able to enter into this shalom the way things ought to be when we start with our relationship with God. If we can have shalom with our creator who has made it possible through Jesus for us to have shalom with him, then That's our foundation for shalom in other areas of our lives. If we have shalom with our creator, then we can have shalom with ourselves. And we can see ourselves as people who are in Christ. And we can have peace about who God has called us to be in Christ. And then if we have shalom with ourselves and with our creator, then we're set up for shalom with others. uh, To see others the way God sees them and to treat them in a way that honors God. And so the final piece of the puzzle then is shalom with creation, our ability to engage with the created world as we were intended to, the way things ought to be. All right, give me a minute. Okay, there we go. So um, the first week of our series, we had keychains available with this uh, symbol on them. If you didn't get one of those, we have some still at the Welcome Center. Just stop by and grab one of those on your way out, just as a reminder of these four aspects of uh, shalom as we continue uh, this conversation today. So today is is shalom with creation, or as I have personally um, challenged myself, peace with geese. Um, It's it's a challenge. I I took a little video just to show you uh, my progress this week. There are my goose friends. Now, there was a time when I would have driven my car straight into this little gaggle to disperse them, not kill them, but to at least scare them. But I'm learning. I'm trying to have shalom with creation. I'm working on that. So that means peace with the geese. I'm not real happy about it, but I think it's the right thing. I'm I'm working on it. Uh, Yeah, geese are, is that for the geese or, or for me? I don't know. Geese are, are uh, awful. They're obnoxious. They're, they're, they're inconsiderate. They're stubborn. Uh, they're not litter box trained. So they leave stuff all over the parking lot, particularly where I park. I think they know where I park. And it's just kind of like that's the latrine uh, for our particular flock that lives here. It's wonderful. They ate a few acres of our soybeans out here because who can stop them? You can't stop them. Um, and there have been a lot of efforts made in, in the U.S. to try to f- figure out how to get rid of geese, and you've got the, the fake coyotes. We, we had one of those. We set it out. Um, they didn't bother them one bit. Um, I've seen fake foxes. We actually have a live fox on our property, and it's like a picture of new creation. The fox and the geese just hang out. They just like each other. <laughs> they seem to not be bothered by each other. Um, it, it's, it's beautiful. Worthless fox worthless. So my question is, can I have peace with geese? I find them annoying. Is that, is that what it means to have shalom with creation? I'm supposed to be at peace with geese. What about like mosquitoes? You know, that's part of creation. Am I supposed to have peace with mosquitoes? Because that's going to be a stretch. You know, there are some parts of creation that I just don't like cats. You know, am I supposed to have, so I'm going to offend somebody uh, in a moment always the goal. Um, but is, does that what it means to have shalom with creation is that I have to be at peace with all these uh, animals? Well, 
Well, I think we, we are going to take a look at a broader picture of that. And um, I think there's this idea in uh, just human culture that we have this responsibility to take care of the planet. You don't even have to be a Christian. There are people who are not Jesus followers who, who believe that we have this responsibility to take care of, of the planet. And I think on the other side, we feel like there's not much we can really do about it. That this is more of a, a global problem. This, this is not something we can solve by recycling or you know, using recycled products or driving a Tesla. Although I encourage that if you can, just you should do it. It's fun. Um, but what, what does it mean for us to try to have shalom with creation when we feel like, okay, we, we should take care of creation, but there's not a whole lot. This feels like something bigger than me. How, how, how am I supposed to make a connection with this? And is it a spiritual thing? So as we begin to talk about peace of creation, I, I just want to point out a couple of uh, Psalms that, that give us just a little glimpse. I mean, this stuff is all over Psalms, but here's just a couple of references from Psalm 24. One, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The earth belongs to who? The Lord. Yeah, not, not really us, but he made it. It's his. Uh, from Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. Not only does he own it, but it, it reflects his glory. And so if we see creation this way, it impacts how we think. Billy Graham uh, said this about our, our view of creation. When we fail to see the world as God's creation, we will end up abusing it. Selfishness and greed take over, and we end up not caring about the environment or the problems we're creating for future generations. So if Billy Graham says it's spiritual, it's spiritual, right? I mean, we have to go along with that. But what he's saying is like, there's this responsibility to see this as God's creation. It's, it belongs to him. It gives him glory. So how we think about it, what we do with it actually matters. So I, I want us to take a look at this from a few different angles today and see if we can broaden our perspective and also uh, kind of get to some personal steps to take uh, to do a better job with this. So the first um, direction we're going to come from is the idea of order from chaos, order from chaos. So we're going to read uh, from Genesis chapter one. We've talked before about how Genesis lays the foundation for our theology, how we see God, how we see ourselves, and how we interact with God. And so we see this as foundational. So um, Genesis 1, 1 and 2, if there's something on the screen that's underlined, you know what to do. That's your part. Read it aloud. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So in the beginning, God created, right? What, what do we have here at the beginning? We have this, this situation that is formless and empty, formless and empty. And then um, we're going to see water introduced, darkness over the surface of the deep, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And as you read through uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, you see more and more of this um, picturing water as this place of chaos and danger and destruction. You see that in the flood story and Jonah and a lot of other um, parts of the Old Testament that, that water is sort of represents this chaos. There's this formlessness and emptiness. And what does God then begin to do in the next verse? God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he begins to bring order to this chaos. He's taking this formless and empty thing and he's putting structure to it and he's filling it with life and goodness and flourishing, right? And in a sense, we are invited to participate with God in bringing order from chaos. That's, that's part of our role as caretakers, guardians over creation, is to participate with him in bringing order from chaos. And one of the ways we do that is by making things, simply when we make things. There's a, a book by a writer named Andy Crouch uh, called Culture Making, where he talks about how when we make things with our hands, when we take raw materials that God made and we bring something out of it that is good and, and brings flourishing in life, that we are participating with God and, and bringing order from chaos. So if you think about when you cook a meal or you bake something, when I bake, I put all my ingredients out, I weigh everything out and set it all out on the counter and I usually take a picture of it because it's, it's interesting to me like, to, to go back after I make something and see where it started. It starts with all, you know, it's a dozen ingredients just on the counter, it looks like chaos and at the end it's, it's a cake, you know? And so it's, it's bringing this order from the chaos of the, of the raw materials. That's, that's a participation with God because I'm bringing something like 
flourishing, life-giving, hopefully delicious out of that. Now, human beings can also take raw materials that God has provided and bring things out of it, make things that are not good for humanity, that don't bring flourishing in life. And so that is in contrast to what we're created to do. But this is what you get to do when you make things. If you take the raw materials of wood and nails and glue and you make a table where people can gather and share a meal, you're participating with God and bringing order from chaos, bringing life and goodness into the world, right? If you take wool or yarn and you knit it into a sweater that keeps somebody warm when it's chilly, you're participating with God and bringing order from chaos and bringing something good into the world. When you take seeds and soil and fertilizer and you plant a garden that produces vegetables or fruit, you're participating with God and bringing order from chaos. When you take a goose's liver and make pate, you're (laughs) participating with God and bringing, uh, I gotta let it go. (laughs) This is what we get to do. So this is why it's important for us to um, bring order from chaos in, 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 our, in our lives, in other areas of our lives. Now, this, this is a personality thing. Some people really like everything structured and neat in its place, and some people are okay with clutter. But there is, there is a spiritual aspect to this. So I know, like, when you're, when you're 15 and your parents come into your room after about two weeks of not being in your room, and they're like, oh, what happened in here? And they say, you have to clean your room. And what do we say? Like, just don't come in here. If you don't like it, don't come in here. It doesn't bother me. Like, I don't, I don't mind the clutter. I, I don't smell whatever you smell. It's, it's not really bothering me. Like, what's the big deal? I live in it. Why is it a problem? Here, here's what you can say. So parent, Christian parents, write this down. Like, you were made to bring order from chaos. And so what you get to do right now, this weekend is you get to bring order from the chaos of this room and you get to honor God in that. Because all of the other answers we give as parents really kind of boil down to, I don't like it, so I said so. You know, do it because I said so. There's actually a spiritual reason that you should clean your room. Do you all hate me right now? Okay, good, (laughs) great. Your parents love me. But that's part of it. And here's the beautiful thing. Like when we do this, I know even as a, as a 15-year-old, when I had to clean my room, when it was done, it felt great. Like there's something about going through that process that connects with us in a spiritual way where we kind of go, yeah, this is, this is how it is meant to be. There's a sense of shalom with that, right? So that's what we get to do. So now your argument can be, I messed the room up so that I can bring order from chaos and experience the shalom, right? Then that's your argument. So I'm helping you out too. You're welcome. So I think that's what we get to do when we make things that that bring life and flourishing. Uh, The other aspect, uh, angle that I wanna come from is this idea of being stewards of creation, stewards of creation. And this, we find this again in Genesis 1 and 2 uh, as God gives the humans their, their purpose, this is from Genesis 1:28. God blessed them and said to them, "Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it." So God tells the humans, "Be, be fruitful. I want you to bring life and goodness into the world, and then you're to rule over created things." And the, the sense of rule in this Uh, language is not like this authoritative, like, you're the boss, you're in charge, you do whatever you want. It's this sense of stewardship and care that God is charging the humans with to care for creation. We see this uh, language show up in the next chapter uh, when God uh, creates the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Like that's his created purpose, not just to sit back and let grapes fall into his mouth, but to actually get involved, get his hands dirty, be a part of bringing flourishing in life out of this thing. And so this sense of, of stewardship is, is not just about trying to maintain some kind of status quo, but to actually make things better, to take the raw materials that God has made and produce something, that's good stewardship. When we think about... Um, when you're responsible for somebody else's stuff. So I know my boys have done some dog sitting, probably for some of you. So there's, a, there's an approach of 
of you know, caring for somebody else's animal that, that you can do like a bare minimum approach. So my goal is the dog's still alive when they get back from vacation. Job done, where's my money? Like you can, that can be the approach, the dog's still alive. Or there's the good steward approach, which is not only is the dog gonna be alive, but it's actually gonna be in better, better condition. We're, uh, it's gonna be healthy and happy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna feed, we're gonna walk, we're gonna play, we're gonna, I'm gonna brush the dog, pet the dog. Um, it, I'm gonna, it's gonna be happier when they come back than it was when they left, right? That's the good steward mentality because it's not your animal. Like you're responsible for making something better than it was when you started, right? And that's the mentality that we've been charged with with creation is to take things and make them better. That's what good stewards do. Jesus tells, uh, tells a parable in the New Testament about a master who leaves some resources with his servants and he goes away. And when he comes back, he's asking his servants, what did you do with the resources that I gave you? And there's one of the people is like, I, I preserved it. I, I made sure nothing bad happened to it. And it's in the exact same state it was when you gave it to me. Is that the guy that gets honored by the master? No, no, he gets punished. It's the ones who say, hey, we took the resources that you gave us and we made more. We did something good with it. and We brought abundance out of it. And those are the ones who are honored by the master. That's good stewardship is to take what we've been given and make more, make something better, bring flourishing and life and harmony. That's being good stewards. And we're called to do that for creation, the things that God has made. And so, Uh, There are a couple ways that I think uh, we as a culture, specifically an American culture, drop the ball on this. I want to address those real briefly so we can all feel convicted and do better, okay? That's kind of the goal. All right. So the first is waste. Um, We waste a lot of stuff. And this is a biblical spiritual principle. In Exodus, when God's people have been set free from hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt, they're, they're wandering in the desert and they complain about not having enough food. God says, I'll take care of your food problem. And he provides this stuff they call manna, which is just like, what is it? They don't really know what it is, so they call it manna. And God says, it's gonna be out there on the ground every morning. You get up, you go get what you need, and you're gonna be fine. But he gives some very specific instructions. He tells them not to collect more than they can eat. And don't try to save it for the next day, but just trust that tomorrow it's going to be there. And so this is what they do. And and things go well when they follow his instructions. Exodus 16, 17 and 18, the Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. This is the mentality of, of taking what God has provided and using what we need and not taking more than we need and wasting, right? So the classic, you know, example of this is, is the 16-year-old guy at a pizza party, right? It's this scarcity mindset that there's not going to be enough pizza for me. And so this is why the adults make the rule, only take one piece at a time until everyone's had some. And you're like, that's a dumb rule. One piece of pizza doesn't do anything. If they didn't have the rule, you go in and you take 10 pieces of pizza to make sure you have enough. And then you only eat seven and three get thrown away because we're afraid that we're not going to have enough. So we take more than we need. And when I say we, I mean me. This is what I did at pizza parties when I was in high school because you're afraid you're not going to have enough. But if, if God has created a world of abundance, If God is going to provide manna every day, then you don't need to take more than you need for this moment. And this is echoed in Jesus' model prayer, right? You remember the model prayer where Jesus says that we're supposed to pray, God, give us today our daily bread, enough for today. I know that you're an abundant God. I know that you can provide for everything. So I I just, I'm asking for enough for today. And we live in a culture where, man, we, we not only have enough for today, we have enough for the next you know, few years, really, if you think about what's in your bank account, what you have access to. A lot of people have enough to get them by for years. And what we end up doing is we take for granted what we have and we end up wasting a lot of it. And wasting is not uh, honoring to the one who, who made the resources to begin with. If I make cookies for my family and for everyone they eat, they throw one in the garbage. I, I feel disrespected by that. I made this for you. This is supposed to bring you joy and you're, you're throwing it away. And, and I wonder sometimes if we don't have that same sort of you know, practice when it comes to the things God has made, we, we take some, we throw some away and it's, 
It's dishonoring to the one who made it all to begin with. So we just need to have a, a mindset that this is, this is something God has provided, and we honor him when we use it in a way that brings life and flourishing to us and doesn't create waste. Our culture um, really doesn't do well with that. Um, I, I just think about, and this is a problem that we're not going to solve today, but you go to a restaurant, you order a meal, and it's like, you just, when they set it down, you know there's no way you're going to eat it all. I mean, some, some of you are like, oh yeah, I can eat it all, no problem. But most of the time, I'm like, there's, there's no way I'm going to eat all this. But this is how they serve it. And you're like, well, I don't, you know, what am I supposed to do? And so I eat as much as I can, and then there's waste, and I feel bad. And so... I'm, I'm sure there are solutions. You guys can help me out with that later. But this is something I think we just need to see more as a spiritual matter than the way we normally take it. It's an opportunity to honor our creator by taking what we need so that there's not waste. The next way I think we can drop the ball on this is exploitation. We just exploit uh, natural resources. And we often think of exploitation as more of a corporate kind of big picture economy thing that really doesn't have anything to do with us, but this is what, you know, big companies do is they go and exploit resources. But I think it even happens on a smaller and individual scale. I mean, if you remember the great toilet paper crisis of 2020, do you remember this? Some of you are like, oh, that was so long ago. That was three years ago, friends. Like, and so you go into the grocery store, there's no toilet paper. And so you start to panic. You're like, all right, what can we use? <laughs> you know? and, but then you go and there's toilet paper. And what do you do? You buy as much as you can. I mean, some stores were setting limits, but before they set limits, people would just buy all of it, right? And more than they need. And then they would take it and either hoard it because they were worried that there weren't, wasn't going to be more later, or this happened, people would sell it right? If you got desperate, you could buy it for $10 a roll somewhere and somebody's making a killing off of this stuff because they're exploiting it. They're, they're taking this resource and turning it into something for financial gain, for profit, for so that I can have more than I need, I'm going to take advantage of this resource. And, and we do that. And so um, this is not honoring to the creator because the abundance is, I mean, there's abundance because there's enough for everyone. And when some have more than they need, then it, it takes away from those who don't have the advantages to, to get there early or pay extra or whatever it is. So we just need to be aware that we have this tendency to turn things into, like, how can I, how can I make money off this? How can I get ahead from this? Um, and it can lead to ex exploiting. This is what Billy Graham said in the quote we read earlier, that when we don't see it as God's creation, selfishness and greed just take over. And we, we, we use and abuse rather than um, be good stewards, bring life and flourishing out of God's resources. So what this leads to is this opportunity to see creation in a different way, um, to see that, that we're moving towards new creation, what Matthew talked about earlier, bringing, bringing heaven to earth. This is what we're moving towards. And Paul lays this out in, a, I think, a really cool way in Romans 8. We've been using Romans 8 sort of as our guide uh, for this study of Shalom. So we're going back there to see how Paul talks about creation. Let's pick up in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Paul's making this, this connection. He's saying there's a link between humans and creation. You can't separate the two. That, that what happens to humans has an impact on creation. So he's referencing the fall when creation is subjected to frustration, not because of its own choice. So he's kind of, you know, anthropomorphizing creation and, you know, giving it human qualities and saying like, all of creation is frustrated because of what happened at the fall. And the fall wasn't creation's fault. Creation didn't rebel against God. Humans rebelled against God. And yet, creation paid a price and is in bondage to decay is how he, how he talks about it. So even though it's humanity, it's our fault, it has this impact because we're linked, we're connected in a way. Um, he goes on, let's continue. This is your part.
Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So Paul would say, just as the consequences of the fall come to humans and creation, then the restoration of all things comes to humans and creation. That what, what we've been suffering, we're going to be set free from. So he talks about creation being set free from this bondage to decay, and that's, that's salvation language. That, that's all the way back to the Exodus and God setting the people free from slavery in Egypt, and that story just gets retold over and over again through the scriptures. Remember, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. This is what he does. This is what salvation is, is setting free the captives. And just as humans, we're going to be set free from our sin and brought into new creation All of creation is going to be set free and restored and redeemed. And this is what we're called to look forward to, is this restoration of all things. And because we know that the created world is suffering in a a real sense, this is part of, of the curse that we see in Genesis 3. Let's go back to that. After Adam and Eve rebel against God and God pronounces a curse, Um, here's uh, what he says about creation, verse 17. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. So again, this link between humans and creation, that the ground was cursed because of human rebellion. Um, And we see see this show up in, in like natural disasters. I've got a couple graphs, and I know you can't read the words, but they're not important. But you see those spots, they indicate where there's been natural disasters um, across the world in uh, this year. This is all from this year, 2023. There's a a map of just the U.S. Um, Again, this is all from 2023, the natural disasters have taken place. And so we see creation groaning, creation suffering, creation looking forward to new, new and restoration. And, and we join with creation in that. And our, our job until Jesus comes back and makes all things new is to continue to work to bring heaven to earth by bringing order from chaos and being good stewards of the creation God has put in front of us. And so this is what I just want us to think about. Like, what are, what are the ways that you can acknowledge that all the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, right? How can we acknowledge that? One, one way is, is like Emily was talking about earlier, is just being in nature and being in the created world so that we, we encounter God, we're reminded of God's creative power, the beauty and the peace of his created world. And so if you haven't had time to be in nature, maybe this is something that you think and pray about is I, I need some time to, to just go take a hike or, or be in the woods or go to the, you know, wherever the place is where you, you see God in nature, to, to a garden, to a field, um, something like that. Um, but maybe it's, it's more in line with what we talked about, bringing order from chaos. Maybe there's something that, that you, you like to make, and it's, it's being able to see this connection between me taking these raw materials and making something good out of it, that I'm participating with God in, the, in that way. Like, I'm honoring the Creator through that. Or maybe it's just paying more attention to the resources that I use and not wasting and not exploiting, but caring for those and bringing good out of them. And so I just want us to think about this because I think it, it impacts how we relate with the rest of the world. Our goal is not to, not to be on any political, one political side or the other or one economic side or the other when it comes to how we think about the environment. Our goal is to have a posture that honors God with the way that we steward creation. And when we do that, I think when we can cut through the noise of all the other uh, voices around this subject and just focus on honoring God with the way we steward creation, I think we get an opportunity to show people that our faith is bigger than just gathering together on a Sunday morning to, you know, sing some songs and hear a message. And it's bigger than that. It's a whole life faith. It, It affects everything we do. And I think this is what people need and what they want. I mean, people don't need, people who are not Christians, they don't need something else to do on the weekends. They don't need just another thing to put on their calendar for Sunday morning. What they need is something that impacts their life in a deep, pervasive way. And that's Jesus, right? And we get a chance to, to honor God and, and reflect his love in the way that we steward creation. And I think it's a beautiful opportunity. So I want us to take some time to pray about that um, before we close today. Would you stand?
Let's pray about this together. Father, thank you for the created world. It's just beautiful. I pray that we can take some time to experience it, to be in it, and to be reminded of how powerful you are, how how beautiful you are, how much you love us to give us a beautiful creation to live in. And I pray that you help us to see the spiritual significance of our responsibility to be good stewards, to bring order from chaos. Would you help us with that? And I pray that we'll do this in a way that reflects your glory, shows people the powerful impact that you have on our lives every day, and it draws people to Jesus. Would you do that in us and through us? In Christ's name, amen. Before we leave today, if you have not signed up yet to serve next week, please do that out here in the lobby. We'll be here at 8.30 next Sunday, not in here, but out there, and I look forward to serving with you, so make sure you sign up for that. Go and be salt and light in a world that desperately needs Christ.